everybody. This is Margie Meachin, the author of Brain Matters, How to Help Anyone Learn Anything Using Neuroscience. And with me today is Dr. Paul Zak. He's a scientist, a prolific author, entrepreneur, TV personality, and public speaker. You may have heard of him as the founder and director of the Center for Neuroeconomic Studies. He's also a professor of economic psychology and management at Claremont Graduate University. Dr. Zach serves as a professor of neurology at Loma Linda University, and he's a senior researcher at UCLA. He has so many degrees. He's got degrees in mathematics and economics from San Diego State University, a PhD in economics from the University of Pennsylvania, and he's done postdoctoral training in neuroimaging at Harvard. He's credited with the first public use of the term neuroeconomics. As you know, we've been following that term for the last year in our newsletter, and he's been a vanguard in this new discipline. He's organized and administers the first doctoral program in neuroeconomics, and that's also at Claremont Graduate University. And he's a recognized expert in oxytocin. His lab discovered in 2004 that oxytocin allows us to determine who we trust. And his current research is showing that oxytocin is responsible for virtuous behaviors, working as the brain's moral molecule, as he, tells, as he calls it. This knowledge is being used to understand the basis for civilization and modern economics. It helps us improve negotiations and treat patients with neurologic and psychiatric disorders. And I'm sure as learning professionals, you're all aware until you earn someone's trust, you are never going to be able to teach them anything. So welcome, Paul. And let me get right to my first question. In your work with oxytocin, you've identified the role that this molecule plays in the development of feelings of empathy and trust. Can you give us just the thumbnail sketch of how it works? Sure, thanks for having me on, Margie. Um, oxytocin is a brain chemical that is active both in the brain and in the body, and until 15 years ago was only known to be released for in three circumstances. Uh, when women gave birth or breastfed, and when both sexes had sex. Um, so it's a reproductive hormone. Um, and yet the brain is making this chemical and it's released in the brain and, and uh, binds to receptors in the brain. So the question was, what's going on in the brain that uses oxytocin? And do men's, men's brains make it as well as women's? And so it, that was sort of a an oddball question because there was no medical disorder associated with too much or too little oxytocin. So we developed protocols where we could measure the brain's acute uh, synthesis of oxytocin. And by doing this through uh, very rapid blood draws, we're able to show that oxytocin is produced in the brain when someone trusts us, when someone shows us a kindness, when someone treats us well, and that oxytocin motivates us to reciprocate in kind. So I think of oxytocin as the biological basis for the golden rule. If you're nice to me, most of the time I'll be nice to you when my brain releases oxytocin. And of course the story gets interesting when we have to ask, well, what does most of the time mean? So in 15 years, we spent a lot of time working on uh, what promotes or inhibits oxytocin release and um, in what occurs uh, in various environmental conditions. Um, so this work took us from you know, my laboratory in California to Ah, oh, gosh, to weddings, to uh, the rainforest of Papua New Guinea. So we spend a lot of time really understanding what this neurochemical does. And as you said, it, it essentially is this uh, chemical that bonds us to others or makes us tangibly care about others. Um, so it's not just the trust molecule. It's the, I call it the moral molecule because this is moral with a small m. This just means essentially uh, treating people in a socially appropriate way. And that's what is necessary for social creatures like humans to survive and to thrive. Thank you for that, Paul. I apologize for the d delay. I was listening to you so closely. I have my microphone on and I forgot to turn back on. So um, let me follow up on that a little bit. Uh, it, because everybody who's listening here really cares about helping people learn. So what's going on with oxytocin when someone is getting themselves into a receptive mode so that they are able to learn from somebody? That's a great question. And that's uh, the bulk of our current work is in that area. So, so let's 
uh, if I may, sort of think of two polar opposites from a learning perspective. Um, one is a fear-based perspective, right? I can threaten you, I can intimidate you, I can be dominant. And we find in those situations is that high levels of stress and high levels of testosterone, which increases both in men and women when we're challenged, when we're, um, when we're uh, in a competitive environment, inhibits the release of oxytocin. So uh, fear is a very good short-term motivator. The problem is it's a very poor long-term motivator. So if I put you in a fear-based environment, um, yeah, you're, you're going to do what you need to do to survive. But it turns out that you don't store those memories very well when you form them in a fear-based situation. Um, and, uh, and you have this, even when you recall them, you have this sort of what we call negative valence. So it feels bad when you remember this situation because you learn this under duress. Uh, and over the long term, if I have a boss or a teacher who's constantly yelling me or threatening me, um, of course, I want to get away from him or her. Uh, but after a while, I just give up. So I, I, I had a boss once, maybe you have too who was a yeller. And no matter what you did, you're going to get yelled at sometime during the week. And after a while, you just don't care anymore. Like, whatever. Like, I just, so uh, psychologists call this learned helplessness. So after a while, you just give up, right? Your boss or your teacher is just a jerk and you don't even care anymore. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not what an engaged learner looks like. So contrast that with a trust-based learning environment where I'm empowering the learner to make mistakes. To, um, to learn on his or her own schedule, to acquire the information perhaps in a nonlinear way. So that all requires that the supervisor or the teacher um, allows the individual who's trying to learn some latitude in how they do that. And we know there are different learning styles. Um, so if I can empower you, if I can show you that I really care about you, that induces your brain to make oxytocin, that reduces your stress response, and now all of a sudden, you're engaged in learning. And, and even from a motivation perspective, you know, we will die for people that we love. Um, but, you know, from a fear-based perspective, I just want to escape. So what I really want to do is, I think, is create a, a really caring, um, if you will, loving environment, loving in the philia sense, where I really care about you. So I tell, I have, I have a 25-person lab, but I tell my graduate students this. So look, if I didn't care about you, I wouldn't be so hard on making sure your research is great because you've got to get a job when you finish your PhD, and if you don't have great research, you're not going to get a job. So you know, if I didn't care, I, I wouldn't be investing so much of my time and energy and emotions in making sure you're really learning to the best possible level. So it doesn't mean you're not holding people accountable and you're not setting clear guidelines. Uh, it just means if I can create this environment in which I'm uh, motivating individuals intrinsically because they want to do you know, where we're guiding them to go, uh, you get much better outcomes long term. You know, um, I think the people who are really good at teaching have always known this, uh, you know, intuitively and have had that, um, that almost need to help other people and, and really love the excitement of seeing people learn and seeing them get better in performance. But uh, to have it, it's so validating to have it help, held up through scientific research because I think sometimes, particularly in the corporate learning environment, there's this opinion that there's no room for emotions and for caring about the people that you're working with. And your research is really uh, disproving that, wouldn't you say? It is very much so. And the work we've done with organizations now, uh, from little startups to Fortune 50 companies, um, shows that in terms of outcomes, you know, business relevant outcomes, where if you create environments where people love to come to work, um, they actually uh, produce at a much higher rate, they innovate at a higher rate, uh, they get sick a lot less, they even weigh less. We found this recently in some work we did with a number of corporations that people who are in high trust divisions of this company actually are, are, uh, are not overweight. So, you know, often eating is a, is a stress response. So, um, yeah, lots of good outcomes occur. Uh, I, I think it is, uh, as you said, a real change in the way we think about, particularly in the corporate setting. Uh, but if you look at some very innovative companies, um, you know, including ones we've worked with like Zappos and Herman Miller, you see very low turnover among employees. You see a good work-life integration and, um, and an ability to really make decisions. Uh, there tends to be less hierarchy and really empowering or trusting uh, everyone around you. 
That's not to say that people are not held accountable. So part of this uh, work we've done in a corporate setting, uh, it's a very important to have very clear outcome goals. So uh, if we could talk for 60 seconds about stress. Uh, so stress is not a bad thing. Uh, chronic stress is a bad thing. That's the stress that you can't get rid of that keeps you up at night. Um, that's bad, but uh, what we call challenge stress, this kind of acute uh, goal-focused response is actually really good for your brain, for your body. People enjoy it. So when you're being challenged, uh, you know, you, you really put all of your energy uh, in gear as well as, uh, you know, drawing your social network. So part of the goal uh, at work in, and in the classroom is to challenge individuals, to be really good at something, to acquire expertise in an area and to guide them on how to do that, but to be really clear on what the outcome goal is. So we need to finish this project in the next month. We know what we have to do to finish it, so it's got to have very concrete goals and endpoints. Otherwise, you're inducing chronic stress, which is not good for learning. Um, so yeah, stress and then, re and then relax. So um, I think one thing we also see happening in the corporate setting is we're all so busy and you're trying to just, you know, keep the bottom line from going under um, that, you know, you finish a giant three-month project on a, on a Tuesday and Wednesday, you got another giant project. So um, the, uh, the brain, just like the body, gets fatigued. And so if you use your brain intensively, you need a refractory period for it to recover. So I think the, the uh, mantra here is, you know, stress and then relax. So just like you're working out, you wouldn't work out for 24 hours straight or 12 hours straight, straight and not rest. Uh, let's not do that in the brain either. Let's have people work really hard have clear goals, recognize them when they, they hit or exceed their goals, uh, and then back off, give them a couple of days to get some sleep, to catch up on email, to see their families, and then a couple of days later, hit them with a new project. Um, so, you know, it's having very clear goals. So trusting people uh, without goals is, is just a stressor. Like, okay, here, Margie, here's your project. Good luck on it. Tell me when you're done. Well, that's not helpful, actually. You know, um, you've got to have clear goals, uh, lots of feedback, um, from a learning perspective, this is much more uh, like a coaching model where supervisors or people with more expertise are coaching those who are trying to acquire that expertise. Uh, in a classroom, we see this as a, as a flipped classroom where the classroom time is less about the teacher uh, trying to uh, dictate to or just expound knowledge towards the students, but really working with students on a project-based environment where they get hands-on experience on how to acquire the information. And often a lot of peer learning goes on as well. I'm really glad you mentioned the flipped classroom approach because the, uh, the folks who are doing that in, um, in the student learning arena are just way ahead of those of us in corporate training in terms of uh, really understanding how you do it and the benefits of it. And uh, we're, we're working towards it. But I don't see a lot of uh, corporate groups effectively using a flipped model. And yet the research shows that that is absolutely the best way to teach many, many things, especially the kinds of things we do in business that are usually project based. So I'm really glad that you, you brought that up for our listeners. Let me ask you something that's a little bit, we're going to change gears just a little bit. I was watching your TED talk and um, you talk about one of the surest ways to trigger the trigger the flow of oxytocin is with a hug, and you demonstrate that. Um, but your research has also shown that when we're interacting digitally through social media, we get the same reactions in our brain as when we're reacting to someone face-to-face. -face. So can you give us some online equivalents for a hug, some things we could do for those of us who work in virtual environments? Yeah, that's a great question. And I should say that creatures, social interactions, positive social interactions, uh, almost any type cause the brain to make oxytocin. And again, give us this desire to want to reciprocate, to tangibly care about others around us, even complete strangers. So it is a powerful effect. Um, the bandwidth online is, is lower than the bandwidth when I see you in person. So um, for those of us who, who often work remotely, it doesn't mean that I never need to, you know, go into the home office uh, or, or make a sales call. Uh, we still need to do that uh, occasionally, but really effective online interactions um, are, a, are a great way to sustain relationships. And again, the larger the bandwidth, the better. So video conferencing, 
uh, better than uh, email, um, you know, better than probably a phone call. So, um, yes, yeah, so it's really thinking about uh, how our behavior uh, is affecting those around us. So um, you call, could call this being mindful of, of what your behaviors do to others. Uh, a simple way to do that is just to identify, sorry, a simple way to sort of set up a, a kind of a caring engagement online is just to identify the emotions you see in the other person. That can be done on video, but also can be done just with audio. So, uh, you know, say we're having a, a, a business meeting today, Margie, and I can say, hey, Margie, you are fill in the blank, or you sound tired, happy, sad, joyful, um, excited. Just call it the emotion you see in another person. By the way, it works great in person as well. And then we get to have a deeper conversation. Rather, rather than getting on the phone and saying, hey, Margie, how are you? Good, I'm fine, how are you? Good, we move on. Say, what's, you know, what's happening in your life? So spend a couple of minutes doing that uh, you know, online handshake, if you will, that you would do, or hug, that really gives you a chance to connect to that person. And it doesn't take a lot of time. You can do it in just a couple of minutes. But now we're having a little deeper conversation about what it means to, uh, you know, to, to really get together and work on something because we're all volunteers, right? Even at work, we're essentially volunteers. So you could go work somewhere else. So I should treat you like a volunteer. Um, you know, if you're a volunteer, you're doing this because you love it. And so I should make sure that I appreciate you, that I'm aware that you have different uh, issues. Uh, probably like if you have been on and video conferencing, where I can see the other person is just not, it's not a good time for them. Right, they're distracted, they're stressed, and I'll just say that. Hey, you know what? It looks like you're having a really tough day. It seems like you're you're really uh, anxious about something. Uh, do you want to have our meeting another day? Maybe this is not a great day for you. And gosh, ninety five percent of the time, someone goes, "How did you know that?" Well, I say, "I just look. I, instead of blabbing, I looked at you. I listened to your voice, and they feel so cared about." And then a week later, we have our conference, and it's so much more effective. So it's really thinking about the other person first, because again, we're all voluntarily choosing to do this thing, whatever it is, work, school, right? Even for, for students in school, they can go to another school, right? They can transfer, they can go to a private school, whatever it is. So I think it's creating an environment where you want to learn, where it's fun, where our interaction is really valuable. So that's why some years ago, I started hugging everybody instead of shaking hands because it's kind of a brain hack, right? I wanna hack your brain to, to uh, get me to, uh, get you to trust me and to interact with me in a, in a warmer way because our overall interaction will be more valuable if we can really develop a, a caring relationship besides a sort of transactional relationship. So um, yeah, I think there are lots of ways to do it, but that's my favorite. Okay, and you know, I think this is an important place uh, to bring up something that you and I, uh, we first started communicating by email, and is that this can't be faked. It's not where um, you can say, oh, well, Paul Zach tells me to hug everybody, so I'm just gonna walk around and do it, and that'll make them trust me. It has to come from a place of sincere caring because our brains can tell the difference, and the uh, fake um, performances um, intended to manipulate us don't work. We, in fact, will trust you less if you don't go into this absolutely sincere about caring for the other person, right? Exactly. We're, as social creatures, we're very good at picking up the fakers. And, and one of the components of building trust is something we call natural. So if you're a leader, you've got to be who you are. And if you're putting on airs and you're faking it and you're being domineering and you're lying to people, you know, very soon we pick that up. You know, we know that when we meet someone new for the first time, they just seem kind of slimy and we don't really know why, but we're just getting a weird vibe. Um, you know, you don't want to be in that world. That's that's not a very effective world to be in uh, because you'll lose all your best people and, and people won't learn. Um, so one way to, to be a natural leader is to allow yourself to be vulnerable. So just like, you know, uh, I'm asking people to be aware of the emotions of others because it's so valuable. It's a valuable piece of intelligence that you should know about. So, you know, pay, be aware of those emotional states. Allow your own emotions to show, right? You might say, gosh, I'm, I'm really having a bad day today for whatever reason. My dog died. Uh, my kid is sick. Um, and if you share that vulnerability, people actually will trust you more 
because you're being a human. You're not a robot. They're not a robot. Um, so again, spend a little time just, just allowing yourself to be seen. And it's an amazing thing about how powerful this is. So again, for the listeners, you can say, oh, this is a, just a great way to hack people's brains to get them to like me more. Um, but the brain has this funny thing, which is the more you do something, the more you bias yourself towards doing in the future. So uh, from a, a sort of training or leadership, leadership perspective, I think this is sort of fake it till you make it. If you kind of force yourself to identify the emotions of others, allow your emotions to show, even if it doesn't feel comfortable to you, if you do it for a long enough period of time, and long enough might just be weeks, um, you know, you just get used to it. And, um, you know, it's, uh, it's a very powerful thing. We are highly emotional creatures. And to think that at work or at school that emotions don't matter, uh, it's just wrong. The, the brain just doesn't work that way. You can't turn off your emotions. Great. That's great advice for all of us, and particularly, I think, uh, for these learning professionals that are listening to you right now. So what are you working on right now that has you most excited? I think you've got something new coming up, right? We do. I'm just finishing a book now on the work we've done for the last 10 years on how to build high trust, high performance organizations. Um, so uh, I should say, Margie, that, you know, uh, it's not like I sit in my in my lab and go, here's the next thing I should do. It's, it's that companies came to me and they said, uh, we've heard you're some kind of trust expert and, and we think this is important in our organization. Can you help us? And, and my first response was, yeah, I can I can come to your organization and show up with syringes and needles and tubes and take blood from your employees. And, you know, then they blanch and they go, no, we can't do that. So so we began running experiments first in my laboratory and then at, at, at for profit companies and at nonprofits where we did take blood from people and measure neurologic activity, but developed uh, a number of survey tools uh, that allow organizations to identify uh, how much trust there is in the organization, but, but more importantly, the factors that can be used to create trust that are, are affected by policy decisions. So I could change, for example, the way I recognize employees and have that impact on trust and on motivation be much more powerful by understanding the neuroscience. So let me give one concrete example. So there, there are you know, a plethora of employee recognition programs, and most of them are you know, just sort of made up. They're maybe intuitively reasonable. Employee of the month parking place, you know, everyone sort of gets, gets a shot at that eventually. Um, but it turns out if you understand how the brain processes social rewards, you can make that impact much stronger. So uh, the neuroscience predicts and, and our uh, experiments uh, confirm that employee recognition programs that are close in time to when the goal is met, uh, no longer than a week, are more powerful. A recognition that is unexpected is more powerful. Recognition that is public is more powerful. And so there's a variety of ways you can use the neuroscience to optimize uh, the, the kinds of policies you're put in place to um, challenge employees to recognize them when they meet or exceed goals, to allow them to grow professionally and personally. And it's really about seeing the people who work for you, as I said earlier, as, as volunteer employees, um, as whole human beings, right? They're, they're not human capital. I don't know what human capital is. Um, maybe it's your skill set, but your human capital comes inside a human. So once you view the human being as having emotions, having their own fears and worries about life, um, you start treating people differently. And again, the, the organizations we work with who do this really well, who have high trust cultures, tend to have very low employee turnover. Uh, an example of that is um, a Boston Con Consulting Group, a really wonderful company, um, has something they call their um, red light alert. So if an employee has worked two weeks in a row, more than 60 hours, then their supervisor gets a little alert and says, hey, check in with this employee because we think this person's working too much. This is unusual. This is management consulting. And, you know, you want to bill as much as possible. But what Boston Consulting has realized is that if people work 60, 70, 80 hours a week, week after week, then they're doing too much work and you're going to burn them out. And these really valuable individuals that you hired and trained, they have great expertise, will volunteer to work someplace else. It's not going to kill them. So I think, again, that's recognizing that 
you can't just grind people down and then spit them out. Uh, by the way, they, as you know, Marcy, there's a, a growing uh, labor shortage, particularly for technically trained individuals. Uh, it's actually binding right now in Europe and the U.S. Uh, very soon we're going to have a shortage of, uh, of qualified workers in many fields. So thinking about corporate culture uh, as uh, another tool to attract and keep the best employees is really smart. There's a big payoff to that. And yeah, I want the people who work for me to be really engaged and happy and self-motivated. Um, I don't need to yell at them. Uh, if they're well-trained and they're smart and they, they the goals of the organization are, uh, cut them loose. Uh, you know, what, what would we call that? I'd call that trust. Trust with training and trust with verification, for sure. Lots of feedback. But you know, hire people who are really good and they're well-trained, cut them loose. If they make some mistakes, awesome. Uh, that's how we learn. As long as those mistakes are not catastrophic, um, I think if we want innovation, we also have to uh, embrace making of mistakes because that's how innovations occur. Absolutely. Well, on those words, we're going to wrap it up. And how would someone get in touch with you if they maybe want you to work with their organization or they just want to learn more? We have a lot of free information at our uh, trusted organization website, which is ofactor.com. O-F-A-C-T-O-R.com and more about me at pauljzack.com. Shoot me an email and um, the book on organizational trust will be out not till 2017. So in the meantime, lots of free stuff you can download, uh, summaries of that work. Um, so yeah, please reach out to me. Happy to, to engage with folks. Okay, and maybe we'll have you back when that book comes out, Paul. That would be great, I'll find on it. Okay, well, everyone, you've been listening to the Brain Matters podcast with Dr. Paul Zach, and I'm Margie Meacham. Thank you very much. And with that, we are out. <laughs>